Hey, if you have your Bible, we'll be turning to uh, Proverbs 23 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Proverbs 23 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Once again, I want to thank Ted and David and Matt for giving me the liberty to share some things here today. And uh, without their help also, uh, Ohio Grace Ministries would just be I, and I'm not a part of I. And I also want to thank you, each and every one of you guys for coming here because it would be pretty sad if it was just us four looking at each other and talking to each other, wasn't it? But anyway, we do appreciate it, and I hope you enjoyed yourself so far. There's some people you checking out today. Shame on you. I will point my fingers at you. Nah, I'm not going to touch you in the wall. But anyway, our theme this year is Finally My Brethren Rejoice in the Lord. And, and my topic this morning is about joy of fitness. And you know, we as dispensationalists know and should know how to discern law from grace, correct? Now, I'll be talking to you guys so you can say amen or you can say yay, nay, or whatever. But we're not going to argue, right? We've got some lawyers in here. We'll just take care of them. No, just joking. Look, we know how to discern from law and grace. We know how to discern from walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. We know how the distinction between Israel's program and the body of Christ and truth from truth. That's rightly dividing the word of truth. We teach a lot of those things, don't we? But this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about fitness. You know, over 55 million people visit 36,000 gymnasiums. That's a lot of people, isn't it? So where's those people at? They're in gymnasiums. Are they in your churches? No, they're in gyms. Also... There's a forecast of 274 million wearable electronics devices that's tracking people as far as what they do in fitness. And they're sold worldwide. Not to mention about 196 million uh, in sales for clothes. So that's a big industry, isn't it? But my intention this morning is not to get you to join a gym, okay? Or uh, wear a tractable or buying clothing. But I will ask you this. How many of you had 100% success in exercise programs? Or diets? It's almost like a performance-based system. You know that? You're setting yourself up for failure. So I was talking to Brother Dez about my topic this, the other day. He reminded me of verse in Proverbs 23. You there? Okay. It only gives you one simple instruction to follow. And if you follow it, it's guaranteed. Okay? Guaranteed results. Proverbs 23, 2. And cut a knife to thy throat if thou be a man who <laughs> can Ice cream. We don't eat uh, uh, ice cream with a knife. <laughs> I'm just sharing that with you. But that's, that, but that's a little silly, isn't it? But it would work. But anyway, the definition of joy that, that the Western 1828 describes is the joy is a delightful mind from the consideration of present or a short approaching possession of good. A delight of mind. And the word fitness, there's several ones that we've used here, is suitableness, adaptation, meekness, justness, reasonableness, preparation, convenience. So this morning, the first part of this message this morning, I want you to think as we go through it, a delight of mind and preparation. Okay? A delight of mind and preparation. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19 starts out with what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Where do you glorify God at? In your body and in your spirit. And the Bible, the Bible talks a lot about the body and spirit, God. And this, uh, so far today, you talk, uh, this weekend, you've heard a lot about the spiritual end and about the joy of the spirit and all. But let's look at the body first. 
And by the way, that verse we always taught our kids when, when they did something unpleasant, we always wanted that verse. Because you're not your own. You're God. What you say? For many of you, if you thought you was going to live this long, would you took better care of yourself? Would you not? Well, yeah, yeah. Did you get up this morning, sit on the end of bed and say, you know something? I just want to be a spiritual wimp this morning. Or a physical wimp. None of us do that. But do you think our body should be in pretty good shape? If the Holy Ghost, the God Almighty that created you, and created His Son, and throws His Son that live inside of you, should we take a little bit better care of yourself? Think about this a minute. Know ye not that your, your, that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know ye not that you're the temple of God, that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Should that not motivate us in a way to, to, to keep our bodies fit, to keep in preparation? You know, being the temple of God. You know, Bible mentions over and over about whatsoever was written aforetime is written for our what? Learning. Learning. So we can learn from things in the past. Do you know what the tabernacle was in the wilderness? You do, don't you? You know the tabernacle itself had four coverings. The first was linen. The second was goat skin. The third was the ram skin uh, colored dyed red. And the fourth was badger skin. You know who was in that temple? The tabernacle? You know what he was surrounded in? Does that sound familiar? Think about that just for a second. You know how well they took care of that tabernacle? Now, look, my understanding it lasted for 500 years and it didn't wear out. So that's amazing. But think, there's some men in the Bible we're going to look at right quick about that seem to be physical fit. You, Genesis chapter 2, and get Joshua chapter 14. You know who Adam was? Joshua 14. Joshua 14. In Genesis chapter 2, Adam was made in the image of God. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, it says, No man was there to till no, no man to till the ground. And verse 15. It says, And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. You know what dress means in the Bible here? It means, it means to adjust, to put in order, to dress as the beds of garden, sometimes to till or cultivate, to prepare, to put in condition. So Adam had a responsibility to work, right? So he's dressing. To keep it means to hold, to retain one's power and possession, not to lose it. Adam was in shape to do this. You with me? You have to be in shape. I know some of you know some farmers, and we'll talk about one in a little bit. Jacob. What do you know about Jacob? He wrestled an angel all night long. And you have to be in shape to wrestle. I wrestled four, or should I say wrestle? Wrestle, there you go. Four out of five years in high school. Okay? I'm serious. We wrestled three two-minute periods. It took all you could do to get through those six minutes. Because the guys can destroy you. You know, sometimes you just felt like giving up. And, and the thing is, it felt like it took forever. You had to be in shape to do that. You know Moses? Moses, you know how old he was when he died? 120 years, and the Bible says his eyes did not dim. Or his natural force abated. You know what abated means? Decrease. Destroy. And I'm thinking about that for a second. I'm thinking he's 120 years old and his natural force didn't obey. I'm like, I like to be like Moses. It's funny because how many goes to chiropractors? Okay. We have a really good chiropractor. I'm not doing advertising here. But he educates you. 
and he told me about the spine, about the chiropractor part of your body, or the, or the spinal part of your body, that it's supposed to last 125 years if it's taken good care of. And every time you get adjustment, it, it increases your immune system 200%. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Because everything of your nervous system, all your nerves is inside of that spine. So you need to take care of that. And I'm thinking about Moses. He, he didn't obey. Where did I tell you to go? Joshua 14. Joshua 14. Verse 7. You know Caleb. Caleb. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Caleb's Bardia to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren, what uh, went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but wholly followed the Lord my God, but I wholly. And Moses sweared on that day, surely, uh, surely the land wherein our feet have trodden should be thy inheritance and the children forever, and because, excuse me, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And verse 10, I'm, I'm going to break this down a little bit. He said, these 40 and 5 years since the Lord spake. So how old is he now? He's 85 years old. And in verse uh, uh, verse 11, as, I, as yet I am strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. The man is 85 years old, and he's going to go up there and fight that for that land. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know the Lord Jesus Christ, right? He walked, and he knew what it meant to have a body to endure things that he had to endure. He was raised in a family of carpenters. Anybody ever worked for a carpenter? Anybody ever worked for a brick mason? Block Mason, you labor, don't you? You work. I remember the time we used to put up oats, and uh, alf oats is one of the heaviest things you can put up in the field. Alfalfa is probably next, and then hay and straw. But it's funny, we used to we used to raise our hand to go out to work in the fields down in Virginia to make 50 cents. Yeah, and it's uh, funny we worked for Miss Fister one day, and she picked my this is a woman. She picked my cousin up like this, and she said, you're not as heavy as a bell of hay. <laughs> she picked him up, put him on the wagon, and that's where he stood. The rest of us are sweating up in the barns and stuff. It's just, I'm thinking, he had been shaken. You know, you had to work, and I'll never forget this time. Well, we used to work with a judge, and the judge would take $2 out of your pay to go out and buy bologna and, and, and bread and... Uh, and bananas and stuff to feed you for lunch. So me and one, one day when my cousin was last in line, we were like, we got a morsel, we got the crumbs. So the next day we was first in line. You know, but we were paying for it. But anyway, that's just a little thing. But Paul, lots of Paul. I'm telling my age, John. I used to work all day in the tobacco patch, two dollars and sixty-five cents. Yeah, that was in that long ago. But anyway, uh, Paul said to have walked over 10,000 miles, three separate occasions. And some of us struggle with 10,000 steps, don't we? You know, i got to get in. i got to get in. Well, I said the other day she did 12,000. I'm like, wow, pretty good. But we got these tracking devices. But look, many others that we can name that knew how to eat and keep their bodies in shape. And I don't think they hung out the local gym. Okay? Any dispensation you'll find brethren that took care of the bodies. When we look at uh, professional athletes, don't we expect them to look good? Don't you pay to go see them to be the finest specimens of professional athletes? You know, the temple of football gods are, what, 25 miles from here? And some of the molds of their uniforms is just unbelievable. You could put two of me inside of <laughs> your legs. They're a bit huge. I'm like, wow. But I note about the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> I notice when they broadcast from their national TV, their TV angle, camera angle, cuts them as giants. 
and they're up there like this, and I'm like, whoa. But American League, their camera is so far that it makes them look like this. And I said, the Indians in trouble. <laughs> you know, that was my biggest fear because they was going against the Giants of the land. You know, but anyway, the outcome was good. I'll, I'll, I'll salute you there. But we think about our, our sons and daughters in the military. We expect them to be in shape, don't we? Mm -hmm. You know, I remember Brother Alex Kerr's mentioned about infantry. What's the root word of, uh, root word of infantry? The babies. They take babies. Babies. You know, and they, it's not that they're going to break you. It's going, they're going to get you in shape to do some things. And I'll think about my son. He's, you know, uh, I'll start crying. About that. But anyway, he's in, he's in service in the United States of infantry. So I watched him do some things. And uh, anyway. He's, he's accomplishing some things that you and I probably never did at our age. But uh, anyway, one of our brothers we know very well, Brother Morris Chestnut. I mean, no Morris. You ever shook his hand? Yeah. It's like a hickory. I mean, he, he's 74 years old, and he'll grab your hand, and he's like... He'll <laughs> <laughs> bring you down his leg. Anyway, you know, listen. He worked that way. It just didn't come natural to him. Right? His dad taught him how to work that way. How many have heard of the Appalachia Trail? Okay, it goes from Maine to Georgia. There's over 2,100 miles of trail. And one of the towns that Sherry used to live in, uh, they have trail days. It crosses there. Well, just two weekends ago, my sister posted, my, my cousin posted, she's a nurse, and they have a medical tent there. There's an 82 year old man hiking the trail. They call him Greg Graveville. He wants to be the oldest one to hike. 82 years old? Hiking the trail. So to me, that's pretty good. In my tent making job, I'm still a special commodities relocation engineer. <laughs> and I'm a truck driver. Okay? And there were some strong songs we used to sing about those big and burly men who drive some trucks around. And, they do these songs and stuff. I met a few of those. And they were huge guys back in the day. They didn't have power steering guys. They didn't have power steering. And they had 255s for air conditioning. So you had to be a, a big guy. Now they drive a truck like this, that type of thing. But, but, I, but in the past 16 years that I've been with this company, the accounts that we service is what they call hand touch freight. So anything from five pounds to hundred pounds we have to touch. And some of the jacks we have to use are manual jacks. And there's 2,500 pounds on that pallet. And you imagine pumping it up and pulling it across that trailer floor to bring it to the rear. It takes a lot. Now, I'm a little smarter. I know you're supposed to work smarter, not harder as you get my age. So I always ask for help. I'm not, I'm not going to kill myself. But it's hard there. You have to be in shape. You know, I'm also the driver trainer there, guys. And it saddens me that I've trained seven out of like nine guys that wants to work. And one of the requirements of our job, we have to get them back to the trailer. And they couldn't do it. You know, it just breaks my heart because, you know, if somebody wants to work. You know, we, we, there's other accounts that you don't have, don't have to get out, but it's sad because they know. They know they need to be in shape. But anyway, one year ago, this year, like this month, no, April, month, they might help me, encourage me to visit a CrossFit deal. Now, CrossFit, here we go now, is a high-intensity fitness program incorporating <laughs> elements from several sports and types of exercise. I'll be 56 years old next month. And I'm like, what in the world am I doing? Because <laughs> there's some things in there you get in that dark spot in your mind. Much like, you know, who you are in Christ. Sometimes there's going to be uh, face some spiritual battles, and we're going to look at that a little bit. But you get that dark spot in your mind, you're like, what am I doing? But anyway, after the foundation class, which is very important, I found myself wanting up more. I remember Brother Ben was talking about some things. He said, Ed, you can hurt yourself. You can hurt yourself. He's right. 
<laughs> if you don't do it right. There's some foundational things in everything we do. And what, 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 what got me was one of the things as I got want to get older, I want to be able to do some things that I'm doing now. That's one of the reasons why I want to be, you know, flexible. But remember that old George Jones song, I don't need your rocking chair, your jerk call, your Medicare. I still got life running through my veins. This gray hair don't mean a thing. That's where I want to be, where I am now. I don't want, I don't want your Jared Hall, you know what I mean? I don't want your rocking chair. I want to be able to do some things in my physical body. And, and, and it's not about me, but yet you know, you know what I'm talking about here. In that foundational class, it gave us some basics. And since then, whatever we do goes right back to that training of that basics. You're out of form. You know, you're breaking your arms down too early. And I'm still not there yet as far as starvation. But I've noticed everything we do, guys, has been taught, goes right back to that foundational class that we, we do. When you first heard about right division, what is the foundational book for the body of Christ doctrine? The book of what? And in the book of Romans, first five chapters, you learn about what? Justification. Then chapter 6, 7, 8, you deal with what? Sanctification. Okay? Then chapters 8, you deal with what? Glorification. Chapters 9, 10, 11 deals with what we call dispensation. We show the distinction of what Israel... God hasn't gave up on Israel, has He? You know? And that chapters 9, 10, 11 explains what God is doing in the dispensation of grace with the nation of Israel. Then chapters 12 through 16 is what? application. What we learned through those first 15 chapters, we can apply to our client their life. Those are foundational truths that you can't get away with. And it needs to be in your mind. It needs to be understanding. It's like, oh man, is that all you have to do is preach Romans? Is that all you ever do? Go back to Romans? No. <laughs> but that is a book of doctrine. What's, a, what's, a, what's Corinthians? What's Corinthians? A book of a... What is it? Correction. <coughs> I thought it was the truth. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, and reproof, and correction. Okay? Corinthians is a book of reproof. Galatians is a book of uh, correction. Then you get to Ephesians, another book of doctrine, right? Talked about the uh, advanced mystery truths in the heavenly program. Then you get Philippians is a book of reproof. You ever, and, and Colossians is a book of what? Correction. You ever notice Philippians and uh, Colossians is not as bad as Corinthians and Galatians as far as reproof and correction? So as Paul grew, you and I can grow through the foundational book of Romans. But I need to move on. Over the last year, I've watched people and myself change to what I think to be good. So I ask, listen, we do CrossFit people, preachers. We do it with pharmacists, contractors, chiropractors, mothers, and mill workers. And I ask them, what brings you joy or drives you to be fit? I'm going to share some of the comments. For me, it's accountability. Because I coach others, I have to be an example. I also want to have a ministry to other women, and fitness is my inlet for that. That's a big motivation. No, a lot, knowing I live will live longer and my the way my heart races and, and blood pumping, the feeling of being alive. I want to uh, I want to say that, that joy for me is a few things. I like the fact that I'm using what God was giving me to the fullest potentials. So everything I do, I make sure that I push myself as hard as I can. Work as if you're working for the Lord. I'm seeing a change in my physical body and experience. One, one lady wrote that she was 70 pounds heavier and I'm not eating and dealing with depression and anxiety when I first started. Now she's feeling better. My reason for being fit is to be a good health for my family. I want to live a healthy life and be an active one. 1 Corinthians 16 always comes to mind. 6.19 For our bodies are, not, are the temple of the Holy Spirit that, that is in us and the bodies are not our own. I want to make my temple healthy. Here's a good one. Having bigger muscles 
than my husband. <laughs> <laughs> then they said, ha ha, just kidding. She said, I have a stressful job and it helps me release some of the stress. We know sometimes we'd be stressful and everything, don't we? But we turn to the Lord, don't we? And we know He's able to provide everything. But as you can tell, some of the comments that I gave, the delight of mine and preparation was in their thoughts. They knew what delighted and they knew how to prepare. Can I say this with love? It's okay to work. It's okay to feel good while you're in your body. But don't do it to become bad. You know, you know, the gym that I go to has no mirrors. You can't sit there and look at yourself. You know what I mean? So, so you don't become vain. Samuel, God told Samuel, but the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his confidence or as high as his statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not the man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh where? On his heart. Proverbs talks about a stubborn heart is the life of the flesh, but envy is the rottenness of the bone. It's a heart issue when you do some things. The Bible teaches us that God created Adam in his image. He was perfect, wasn't he? He was the perfect man God created. But David's talking about taking that dust and water and making mud. Mud. The psalmist mentions, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. You know that God was not an unfit or lazy God? And when He made creation, we shouldn't be lazy either, should we? And we, if we have the mind of Christ on, should we understand how to keep our bodies in, in shape to do the work of the ministry? Now, I may mention about the tabernacle. If it was set up out here right now, and we was told to move, how many of us could get up and move that tabernacle? It's hard. I know what we do. We point at Justin. <laughs> ben. Y'all you know, go move it for us. You know, we'll tell you where to put it. But look, I mentioned CrossFit. Something should, shouldn't. Everything we do to the glory of God because what He did at the cross. This is what makes us fit. This is what, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection, doesn't He place us in His fitness program? Yeah. You know, I mentioned special commodities relocation engineer, and I mentioned that to a waitress, and she looked and she said, that's what the Lord does. He's a special commodity. He takes His special commodity, and he's an engine, he relocates us. And I'm like, I'm not using it. <laughs> I know what Linda calls me. Linda, she's in the nursery. Linda calls me special ed. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're all special. You know, hey, in the mystery program, it was hidden God before the world began. Is that something special? The body of Christ, is that something special? You're something special. But anyway, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Now, before you were saved, go to Romans chapter 1. Get Romans chapter 1 and second, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Romans chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 2. Before you were saved, how did you glorify God? Was that? You didn't glorify God the Creator, did you? But you did glorify God. You either glorified yourself or, or God of this world. In Romans chapter 1, 21 says, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of a corporal God into an image made like a corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creepy things. Wherefore, God also gave them up gave, gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own, their own bodies, between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served a creature more than the Creator, who, who is blessed forever. Amen. For God gave them up, into vile 
perfection. So how was you, before you were saved, what does this tell you how you was serving God? It wasn't too good, was it? Ephesians chapter 2. But what we read, was that good though? Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespassing sin. Wherein, in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience, among whom some of us had our conversations. This is personal, guys. This is you, before you were saved, this is what your spirit was doing, who all had our conversations in time past, and lust of the flesh, flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And in the dispensational view of verse 11, wherefore remember that you be in the time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. You know God's finger pointing there, isn't it? God made a distinction there. Then he says, that at that time you would adopt Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Was that good? Hey, some people asked me if I believe in uh, spaceships and stuff. I said, I believe in aliens. They looked at me and said, I was one of them. I was an alien. You was too? An alien. Our spirit was dead to God and we delighted in the mind of things not to serve Him. Our spirit did that. Now your soul had a conscience of God and had a beacon that pointed to God. Your soul does. But your spirit was dead. Your mind, if you can. But once you got saved, once you heard that Christ died for your sins and buried and rose again, He took your spirit, He circumcised it, He baptized it into Him, Okay? And it becomes a new spirit. You can communicate with God now. Before you could not before you couldn't communicate with God the way you think you could communicate with. But once you were saved, our suitableness, our adaptness, adaptation, our meekness, our adjustment, adjustment, our reasonableness, which is a de definition of fitness, should change. The reasonableness of an inner man has to be able to know that there's an enemy out there that's battling against us. We're changing to our spiritual part of our fitness. And we love to talk about this. We love to talk about our spiritual man. We love to talk about our inner man, right? That's where we're at. We know we're seated in heavenly places. You know, I think about Romans 5 when it talks about tribulations, work of patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope making all shame. You break that down in age groups. Tribulations, 0 to 20. Oh, my hair. That boy don't like me. That girl don't like me. It's all tribulations, right? You've been there. But from 20 to 40, it's patience. You get a job. You meet that spouse. You meet that girl. You meet that boy. You settle down a little bit. You know, you've got a little patience. Then 40 to 60 is an experience. You don't, even though you go through tribulations and patience, don't you handle a little bit different if you're in that age group? You know, experience. Then 60 to 80 is hope. Okay? And hope not to make a shame. 60 to 80, you don't care about, you know, you don't get upset. I want some of you guys, hey, it, it's going to be okay. You know? It'll be all right. It'll work out. Because you know what? Tribulations, patience, experience. And I've treasured that in, in some of you elder guys and gals. You don't realize how much I do. And I miss some of the guys that got wrong before, like Brother Ray. You know, we lost Paul this, this year. Didn't we? No. But anyway, uh, I missed that. And we should, we as younger people should understand that elders are there for a reason. And as you've got kids, you ever notice your kids won't listen to you, but they listen to somebody else? And you did exact they did exactly what you were doing, did. And you're trying to share with them, and they're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I'm talking about? You did. So think about this for a minute. How do you know? How do you know that you're being attacked as a spiritual war problem? How do you prepare your mind? By renewing, don't you? In Romans 12, 1, and this is covered, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your... That's your spirit. You have to renew your spirit, your mind. That's how you understand these things. Then it gets down in your soul and it starts to make a difference in that inner man. No, it starts to make you fit. You ever notice people knows, knows the Bible, but when they don't write the divide, they're all confused? And you sit there and you're trying to talk to them and they're like, they're arguing with their Bible. And then finally when you show them in your Bible what God is doing, they're like, that, that's what you say. Their spirit is not where they should be. And when you try to force some things into your into your soul that's not right, it don't work. When you're saved today by trusting Christ out for your sins and they rose again, He places you into a body. And what books do people tell you once you're saved and what is going to go to? John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Have you ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? They could not do what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John could do. And they want you to do it? You've got to rest in who you are in Christ Jesus. And when you renew your mind, you are renewing your spirit, and that's what makes us fit. That makes us understand some things. And you know, when you can understand some things, and like in Romans, uh, excuse me, Corinthians chapter 2, you start comparing natural man, the spiritual man, the carnal man, the babes, and says, Well, what knoweth the man the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him? Man can talk to man again. But does that spirit of man know the spirit of God if he's lost? He don't, does he? We have the verse 6 to 16 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says that we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Where do you find that mind? Books about books about books? In the book. In the book. Having the mind of Christ Shouldn't that bring us joy? We've talked a lot about joy this week. We talked about joy of people that we didn't even know when we read the Bible and they had joy. But shouldn't that bring us joy? And our, you know, you know what the sad thing is? My mind is not like your mind. You probably said, Praise God, hallelujah. <laughs> and your mind's not like my mind. Thank God. But we got the mind of Christ. So and we can understand and we can have joy in the things that we're doing. That's why we come to Bible conferences and get, to get to know each other. You know, it's one thing to be individually embodied, right? You also come together corporately. And that's when we get to know how you're feeling today, you know, and how you're doing today. And then you get to meet this guy over here. You're trying to start a church and we want to help you, you know. you got a little Bible study going. We need materials. That's why we come together in regional conferences and stuff to help people. There's a lot of new people here this this weekend. That's exciting. Once again, shame on the ones that are not here. But uh, and, you know, that's what facts of life is facts of life. Isn't it? But look, First Timothy chapter six. We have the mind of Christ on, and even when we are faced with some things. Like in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. If any man teach otherwise, verse 3, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doping about questions and strife of words, Whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, evil, submissive, perverse disputings of man of corrupt minds, and the dissolute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. You should withdraw yourself from that. How do you know? How, if you don't have the Spirit of God and the mind of God, how do you know distinct that? But withdraw yourself. Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of evil, which, which while some co covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Are they joy there? Have you ever been there? Some of those things. Before I was saved, I was there. Once again, we all had our conversation. But verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. 
follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and have professed a good profession before many lips. We can have joy now. Fight the good fight. You know, just like that soldier fighting a war, fighting a good fight, shouldn't we also stand? We have to individually stand, guys, Amen. for some things. You got a family to take care of? That's your first minister. Amen. Okay? Then you get involved in the local church. That's the pillar and down to the tree. Then you then you find out other ministries that you can help. Okay? But listen, the spiritual battles that are here today that we fight are no different than the days of old. Paul was dealing with the same things we, we deal with that. He saw young Timothy dealing with some things that we're dealing with today. Until the Lord comes back and takes us out of here, you're going to deal with the same things that, that they did. And you think, are there any hope? Well, are they? In Christ Jesus they are. Turn to second, uh, uh, well, you don't have to turn there, but 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll go ahead and turn there right quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Chapter, chapter. Get 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'll read 2 Corinthians, okay? How's that? Yeah. Unless you want to follow me to see what Bible words are going to be done. Just joking. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, For we, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Let me mention this last night, would it? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through the God to the pulling down the strongholds, casting down imagination. You know what that is? Vain emptiness thinking. Okay. Where's that tack at? Right here in your mind, isn't it? You know when God told Israel to go into the land, He told them to destroy everything. Else. Pictures. Burn everything under a green tree to destroy it. That imagination, that image, those things that you, you're thinking about, destroy it. And every, uh, on every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing ca captivity every thought of obedience of Christ. See? It's, it starts right here, and that thinking gets in there, and we start thinking some negative things. But that negative soon becomes a positive if you stay on that track. And you'll start getting negative towards God, and positive towards man, and positive to situations that you're in, and then you're like, you feel hopeless. But you've got to be fit up here. You've got to be spiritual fit up here. That's why the Word of God gets inside of you and gets down in your soul. And that makes the difference. That inner man. Satan develops those strongholds and it starts where? Right here. Right here in your mind. How do you defeat that? How do you get that out of your thinking? I know. Turn on CNN. <laughs> fake news, fake news, fake news, fake news, fake news. Fake news, fake news. All that stuff, right? You you indoctrinate your mind with that one-eyed monster. <coughs> Evil ice cream. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, no, you have to renew it with the Word of God. And that's how you defeat it, by renewing the Word of God. It is your thinking process. You want to defeat, you want to detect, you want to destroy those strongholds. That's in your thoughts. You bring every thought of, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And you first, you think first because that is where the victory is. And who? Christ. We cut the line of Christ off. It's already won. The battle was. It's already won. We just have to keep renewing our mind and keep fit. You have to be spiritual fit, guys. And when you face with things like Timothy was, you have to have the best of mind, spirit, so you can handle the things which will bring you down. I told you 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils, speaking lies of hypocrisy, having their conscience sheared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to receive with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing can be refused. 
if it be received with thanksgiving, but if it's sanctified by for it is thank, sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If you put in if, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourish up the words of faith and good doctrine, whereby you have attained. But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. But bodily exercise profit little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is, and that which is to come. Speaking expressly, depart from the faith, so he given heed to seduce the spirit. You know what all that is? What's that? Faith. Fake news. <laughs> seducing spirits. Who's, who's those seducing spirits out there talking and trying to convince you about other doctrines and, and hooking you into other religions? Preachers. That should make us angry and sin not. You know, some of the people in the, you know, in those churches, they may not know better, but that preacher should know better, should it? Teaching other strange doctors and all. And that, uh, that verse with, for body exercise profit little, I was thinking maybe I should use that verse. But if you stay in a context, these people are working in a religious system to try to please God in their works. Okay? In the works. You know, I could go on and on and on, but I'll leave you with this. The Bible says in Romans 5 8, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were at sinner of what? Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more than being reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? His life. Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the atonement. The Father had joy in his son. And we are in who? Right. And so, my joy of in fitness, my delight of mind in the adaptness is complete in Him. Amen. It's seated in heavenly places. It's no wrath. Okay? Count it faithful in Him, having a ministry of dispensational truths. And seeing my family and many of you grow and continue to grow. Finally, my brethren, Rejoice in the Lord. Father, once again, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much in life. And Lord, as we think about who we are in Christ, that we can really enjoy the joyfulness in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.